Hi everyone, welcome back to Lecture 8B of Useful Genetics. Here we're going to take our discussion of Mendel's findings from the last lecture and put it into the framework of what we now know about the mechanisms of inheritance and how genotypes cause phenotypes. And I think you'll see that what's often taught as Mendel's laws, a set of rules that you need to memorize, is actually just the obvious consequences of things that you now already know. So here's our list again of what Mendel found out by doing the first genetic analysis. So one of the first conclusions we described from Mendel's work was the separation of the elements that are inherited that control the physical properties and the properties themselves, the separation of genotype and phenotype. Now we know that this must be the case because we know that what's passed down stably from cell to cell, from generation to generation, is not molecules such as proteins, but information. Information is what is inherited, and it's inherited in the physical form of DNA sequences. We also know that DNA is very stable, and it very rarely changes its sequence. So this means that what's passed on is something that isn't constantly modifying into something else, but is stably inherited. And we understand how the genotype specifies the phenotype, that the DNA contains coded information that specifies the sequences of proteins, which are then ultimately responsible for almost all the phenotypic properties of the organism. Now, here are some questions for you about um, the things that Mendel discovered. So he concluded that the ova and pollen each contain only one version of each hereditary element, and that these versions are randomly chosen from the two versions present in the parents. What is it that we know that explains this? So here's a series of statements. Which of these statements describes the process, the concept, that underlies what Mendel observed? And the answer is that each pair of homo homologous chromosomes, the two sets of elements present in the parent, are separated into daughter cells at meiosis 1, so that each daughter cell only gets one version of each hereditary element. Here's another question. Mendel found that when a plant has two different versions of one of his elements, two different alleles, that these versions don't influence each other. Instead, they're passed unchanged into the gametes. The fact that allele A was, A1 was sharing the cell with allele AB didn't change it in any way. Again, which of these statements underlies that observation? And probably the most important one is that genes are sequences of independently replicating DNA on chromosomes that the replication of the DNA of one version doesn't affect the replication of the other version. And a third question. He concluded that when a plant has two different versions of an element, those versions move independently into the gametes. Which of these statements made that sometimes true? Not always true, but commonly true. And the answer is that the cause of the ability of elements to move independently is that they're on different chromosomes. What we now call non-homologous chromosomes have different genes, and they move independently when the cell divides. And finally, question four. It's the same statement, but now we're asking, which of the following phenomena makes that conclusion not always true? It was true in Mendel's experiments for the cases he studied, but it's not always true. And the answer is that sometimes different genes, alleles of different genes, don't move independently because those genes are on the same chromosome. 
Each chromosome contains many genes, so it's often the case that two different genes are on the same chromosome and they don't move independently into the daughter cells. Now, we've talked a lot about all the amazing things Mendel did discover, but he didn't discover some very important things that we now know are true. He didn't discover linkage, for instance, and we'll talk about why. He didn't discover that a gene could have more than two alleles. And he didn't discover alternatives to dominance. So why didn't Mendel discover linkage? Well, mostly he was lucky. This is a diagram showing the seven chromosomes of peas and the locations of that we now know are the locations of the genes that he studied. And you'll see that most of these are on different chromosomes. Importantly, the genes that he concentrated on, the phenotypes he concentrated on, are coded for by genes that are on different chromosomes. And it may be that he discarded some of his possible variants because the results were confusing because we, the genes were, we now know, on, diff, on the same chromosome. But we don't know that for sure. Now, Mendel didn't discover that a gene could have more than two alleles, and he didn't discover that there were alternatives to dominance. In his work, he concluded that there were two alleles, one was dominant and one was recessive. And the reason he didn't discover that was because he was very careful only to work on situations that he could clearly analyze. And he explicitly said that some of the characters he tried to study didn't give very clear distinctions between phenotypes. So tall plants, short plants, um, yellow peas, green peas. If he had a trait that just kind of blended between different types, he set it aside as not being suitable for his experiments. And so he didn't discover the situations that we now know make real alleles much more complicated than the ones that he, or most real alleles more complicated than the ones he studied. So what we've done in this lecture is to consider how we already now, we, us, in this course, already know the conclusions that Mendel came to, and we know the properties of the mechanism of inheritance and the behavior of genes that are the causes of the things that Mendel discovered. So we don't have to remember Mendel's laws. We know all the principles from first principles. We also understand how come Mendel didn't discover some things that we now know are true. It was a consequence of how carefully he chose what to study and how to study it. Coming up next, we're going to talk about how you can do genetic analysis well and try to clarify some of the misconceptions you might have about how to go about solving the kinds of genetic problems that Mendel solved. I hope to see you there.